What's up, everyone? Welcome to my series on things not in the Bible, people think are in the Bible. Today's topic is church governance. Who gets to decide what in church? Now, most people think, well, let's just look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say. Well, Jesus said almost nothing about church governance. There wasn't really a church until Pentecost, which was 50 days after the resurrection. So we don't get any help from him on this one. He talked about ethics, talked about spirituality, talked about the kingdom, talked about forgiveness, talked about love, did miracles, told us very little about how to run a church. Now, the Apostle Paul, in the pastoral epistles especially, gave some advice to Timothy and Titus about how to run a church, but most of that is more descriptive than prescriptive. You see, Paul wasn't writing Torah version 2.0. He wasn't replacing the Old Testament rules with a bunch of Paul rules. He wasn't doing that. In fact, he wanted us to get past the law. The law is a good thing, but he wanted us to live by the Spirit. You can read about that in the book of Galatians. So he gives some advice, but the advice is not consistent because he's giving a little bit different advice to Timothy than the advice he's giving to Titus. Titus is on Crete. Timothy is in Ephesus. Different situation, different advice. And Paul doesn't use the same words for leaders in the church. He uses overseers or bishops. He uses elders or older people. And he also uses deacons or servants. And it kind of mishmashes all over the place. So he wasn't coming up with a blueprint for churches for all time. And if you look at the New Testament, there really isn't any ordination of pastors. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it talks about the five leadership gifts, but that doesn't specifically translate into certain offices that you need to fill in your church. You need five offices in the office wing with these five things. He's just talking about leadership in general. And leadership in the early church was flexible, and it depended on the situation because certain small churches, and they were all small for the first few hundred years, they were house churches basically, had a bunch of leaders and some were kind of leadership short. They had to kind of do with what they had. And you might say, well, you should never let a new convert be running the church, but that's exactly what Paul did in Philippi. It was just there a short period of time and left some leaders in charge. So it depends on the situation. Now, the three forms of church governance common in the English-speaking world go by the names of Episcopal, Presbyterian and Congregational. That has nothing to do, by the way, well, that's something to do, but I'm not talking about the denominations called Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Congregational. I'm talking about the different ways to run the church. Who gets to decide? Here in North America, you have to have a board. You have to be a nonprofit organization to be considered a church, legally speaking. And that board has the officers or deciders in the church for buying property, doing those kinds of things. You need to have some organization. You might say, well, I don't like organized religion. Well, we have organized everything, folks. We have organized grocery stores. We've got organized post offices. You don't like it when you show up at the DMV and they're not organized. There's nothing wrong with good organization, doing things in good order. Now, these three different forms of church governance tell us a little bit about who gets to pick the board. In a church with Episcopal governance, the one pastor or the district office chooses the people who sit on the board. In a Presbyterian style governance, which is team oriented, the team gets to choose who the leaders are. So if there's a vacancy on the board, the board gets together and invites a new person onto the board. In a congregational system, you have the whole crowd. And the whole crowd, everybody who's a member of the church gets to vote and they get to vote in that group of people, or the officers. So it's either Episcopal, Presbyterian, or Congregational, led by one person, led by the team, or led by the crowd. Now, each of these has their upsides and downsides. The upside of the Episcopal way of doing things, Calvary Chapel uses it, the Methodist Church uses it, is that you can do things really quickly. Most brand new churches tend towards the Episcopal model. You gotta be able to turn on a dime to get things going. And most of the largest churches are Episcopal in orientation, most of the mega churches. Team-oriented churches, the good thing about team-oriented governance is that teams are smart as opposed to individuals and crowds. You don't want people to get in with the wrong crowd. And crowds can do all kinds of crazy things. And so 
teams tend to be intelligent and they can make intelligent decisions. The downside of the team orientation, the Presbyterian orientation, is that it can turn into a clique. There's insiders and outsiders, and people outside of that team feel like they're on the outside looking in. And then there's the congregational model, which is really good for rural churches that have a hard time affording a pastor. This is why most Baptists and Lutherans have a congregational polity, because in the upper Midwest, in the deep South, there were lots of rural churches, and most of them couldn't hang on to a professionally trained pastor for very long, and they had to be able to divvy out all of the tasks. And you get maximum participation with a congregational model. However, the problem with that is that one crabby person who shows up once or twice a year and gives 20 bucks in the plate, that person has as much say at the meeting as the person who's the volunteer and shows up every Sunday to light the boiler, get everything going, and to clean the church on Saturdays. So that's not fair. The responsibility and authority teeter-totter is out of balance. So there's good things and bad things about all three models. None of them are prescribed in the Bible. We don't have any officers in the Bible, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't have any leaders. We need leaders to do things, to make decisions, to, to move forward, to decide who's going to teach, who's going to lead worship, uh, where the money is going to be spent, what missionaries we're going to support, all of those kinds of things. So we need leadership. It's been said that the early Christian church was a movement. It moved to Greece and became a theology. We came up with the Trinity and the creeds and all that stuff, moved to Rome and became a huge corporation moved to Europe, and it became a national church, the Church of England, the Church of Sweden, the two national churches of Germany, evangelical and Catholic. And then it moved to America and became a nonprofit 501 corporation with a board. And none of those are more biblical than others, and all of them are organic manifestations of the culture itself. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is the Bible doesn't give us a blueprint for church governance. And it's a good idea in your church to question whether or not it serves the needs of the 21st century. Do you want to keep going with a congregational model, which is designed for rural churches, in an urban area with a big church with a big budget? Probably not. So be open-minded when it comes to church governance, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Use common sense and do more of what works and less of what doesn't. That is the teaching for today. I'll talk to you again tomorrow.